Hello and now welcome to this video on the different stains used in histology and what they do. Although for this video it might be more accurate to say histopathology rather than histology. If you've ever purchased a slide set that contains any kind of tissue from an animal or human, you will likely see they come in a range of colours. Some of these will be just the colours of the sections cut, while others are stained to accentuate the slide and features of interest. This is effectively the role of histology. That is, to study the microscopic structures using various supporting agents. Most often, we're talking about a stain. For this video, we will focus on medical histology as it is somewhat narrow in scope by comparison to the kinds of stains and similar that are used elsewhere in the literature, and more accurately, for our purposes, the medical histology is somewhat better described in said literature. Medical histology is effectively the microscopic study of tissues and organs. What you do to do that is you take a sample. Generally speaking, this would be something like a biopsy. You section it, stain it, and then examine it under a microscope. This can also be called microscopic anatomy and histochemistry. Further to this, you also have histology allowing for very clear visualization of what's going on, especially the structure and characteristics of what's happening. This is particularly important when you're looking at changes in the structure and anatomy. For example, a cancerous cells look very different under a microscope compared to normal cells. Because of all of this, it's often used for medical diagnoses, studies in science, autopsies, and even forensics. The arguably first and most common stain to talk about is hematoxylin and eosin. This is a pair of stains used in conjunction and is effectively a basic dye. What it does is work on acidic structures, or at least the hematoxylin does. It turns them a bluish purple color. Those that are particularly prone to this are things like basophils. Basophils are commonly filled up with very large nucleuses, and this means that they're well described in it. But you also find that they are good for staining things like RNA and ribosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum. Eosin, by contrast, is somewhat more useful at, well, staining basic structures. It is somewhat acidic, and this is why the two will interact. When this happens, it causes a pinkish-reddish color. The benefits of this are that, particularly for cytoplasmic structures, they tend to be better stained in that environment. A gram staining is a, another option that is relatively common, and often instead used for bacteria rather than necessarily for cells. What you find is that the peptidoglycan wall that makes up the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria will more readily take up the gram stain, leading to it being stained a very obvious color. This is useful to separate out the gram-positive bacteria from gram-negative bacteria. It's also a relatively straightforward stain to use. But because the use of gram stain generally involves coloration and then washing away the color, the gram-negative bacteria tend to either have no obvious coloration or a very light coloration from the gram stain by comparison. Next are dryamsus stains. These are used particularly for hematology, that is the study of blood and blood sources like bone marrow. Think of things like if you take a blood sample and you spread it over or smear it over a slide. If you want to see what is in that blood, like parasites, this is a good way to go about it. They can also be useful to visualize chromosomal abnormalities. Moving on to uh, less common options, and arguably another less common option, is the uh, periodic acid shift reaction. This is also sometimes just given by the acronym a PAS stain, a periodic acid shift, PAS. And this is used to look at these structures, particularly those that are rich in carbohydrates. So think of things like sugars within the intestine, uh, renal cells, and reticular fibers. These structures tend to take up the stain more readily. Because of this, they are useful. Then on the other side of it, you have things like glycogen, glycoproteins, glycolipids, and mucins stained red or a magenta color when the staining process is completed. This tells you what's happening. It works entirely based on the sugar molecules producing aldehydes, hence the name periodic acid shift reaction. Without the reaction, you don't get the necessary red magenta color from it. A Mason's trichrome is, unsurprisingly, a multicolor result when used. 
the name kind of gives that one away. What makes this useful is that it has a red counter stain, it has a blue stain, and you can get something of a mix in between depending on what you're looking at. It is uh, notably helpful as uh, tissues will be stained a reddish colour, while the uh, bluish colour will tend to stain the fibres that are around it. The Congo Red is a, another example that's used, and one that is more reliant on pH than anything. It is a water-soluble dye that, well, rather obviously, it turns a reddish colour, but it only does so at a relatively low acidic pH of 3 to 5. The interaction of this stain, due to its hydrophobic nature, causes it to collect in tissues. Because it collects in tissues and it tends to bind to amyloid fibres and produce a coloration, it helps in identifying amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is, well, useful in identifying things like neurological diseases. A Prussian blue is a Another example of less frequently used by itself, but used in conjunction with other stains. It's helpful in identifying iron stores. So, for example, if you're trying to figure out hemoglobin in red blood cells, or if a liver has an excessive amount of iron within it, and so on. The idea is you first stain the tissue using hydrochloric acid. This helps to expose the ferric ions, or the iron ions, to the blue pigment of Prussian blue. This is necessary as the blue pigment is insoluble. When it binds to the iron you get hemochrosis or hemosiderosis. This is effectively when the liver, for example, gets an excess amount of iron building up in it. And you'll see this is a, unsurprisingly, a blue stain within the tissue sample. By contrast, the lack of a blue stain is also indicative of problems, for example, anemia. If you're looking at, uh, for example, bone marrow or blood, you should see a blue stain present. However, if you don't find a blue stain present, that means that there are either no or low iron levels. This would be indicative of something like anemia, which is the exact opposite of excessive iron buildup. Mucinc Carmine is a, another option, and again, this one is a less used, although it can be used for certain applications. It's a stain that primarily focuses on epithelial and connective cells. These cells are, for example, things like your skin, the tissues under your skin, and so on. The contents within the stain, which is primarily made up of aluminium and carbine, Carmine, not carbine, form a uh, charged complex, and this causes a chelation process. This chelated product binds to mucins, and they turn a red colour as a result. This helps in figuring out if there's a carcinoma or an inflammatory process going on where you're trying to stain. This can be helpful in locating a tumour. So, for example, if you take a tumour out of an individual, you will proceed to do an incision around the area that the tumour was thought to be in, and you will take a section of that and you will see whether or not there continue to be tumorous cells on the periphery of the section you've just taken. If it's still present, the surgeon will continue to cut away and further expand on the incision that is being made. It can also be used for certain Cryptococcus fungi species. The next we have for you is Sudan Black, and these are a lipid-based triglyceride structure. They also have lipoproteins present. Unsurprisingly, they do produce a dark result, going from what is effectively a dark black through to a brownish colour. The Sudan Black is often used in conjunction with oil Red O, and we'll explain what that's for shortly. But the uses of it are to identify the presence of lipids, so, for example, if you're worried about atherosclerosis or plaques in the arteries, this is one way to investigate the presence. It can be useful in, say, postmortems, or more frequently in research when looking at animals that have been euthanized and you want to understand if there are lipid-related, uh, let's say, comorbidities, or more likely, the targeted and intended morbidity. Oil Red O is, in some ways, similar to the sedan black that is used. It's more frequently used, largely because it is hydrophobic, that is, it does not like water. Because of this, it will build up in the fat more readily and more easily. This allows you to visualize what's happening. Further to that, because of its very distinct coloration, whether you use this or Sudan Black, 
you'll often be able to use automated software to be able to uh, more easily capture and analyze what's happening. This is particularly important in research where you want to compare different samples taken from different research groups, let's say. Next we have a much lighter stain, quite literally. This is a silver stain. Although arguably not as common in some respects, it does get used, and notably in the brain. It's used in studies for neurological diseases because silver staining works where others simply do not in the brain. The silver itself works in conjunction with various salts or similar that are ionic and therefore able to either penetrate into the neuron or bind to the periphery of the neuron's cell wall and therefore mark where various things are. This can be useful if you're doing fluoro labeling. That is, for example, if you've attached a fluorescent compound to this stain. Because of that, you can easily identify different parts of and different actions of neurons. So for instance, if you want to follow the activity of a given receptor or releasing vesicle, you can do so if you stain it with this, although that can be much easier said than is done. Much more frequently, it's used for things like amyloid beta proteins, where you're not so worried about whether or not you're going to cause damage, as the amyloid plaques are already not only a dam damage product, uh, but they're also they're something you really need to be able to figure out, and so the buildup of a large amount of the silver material becomes a very dark and very obvious spot. And next we have nissel stain. A nissel stain can also be called the creosyl violet stain, and this to a certain extent needs a basic component to it. This again is often used in the brain, and sometimes even within the spinal cord itself. Like other similar more basic stains, it leads to a bluish coloration, although this can sometimes even be purple. It primarily binds to the internal workings of the cells allowing you to look at the organelles within them. And most notably, you're going to be targeting things like ribosomal RNA with this, although you can also look at targeting other parts of the cytoplasm with it. The final, let's say, common stain as such is the papinacol stain, and we've no doubt butchered the name for it. It's also generally referred to as the pap smear stain. You can probably figure out where this goes fairly quickly. It's used to detect cervical cancer within cervical swabs of female patients. In short, the cells are exposed to it after being collected, the cells after being processed are given hematoxylin for the nucleus, orange G for keratin, eosin for structures, a light green SF for cytoplasm, and Bismarck brown. It's effectively a combination of different stains. Because of the nature of it, it's just treated as a collective stain, because it's used for one specific purpose. The last two categories we have are not necessarily commonly used. Rather, they do get used, but not in diagnostic settings. Rather, they're often used in research settings. These are antibody stains and fluorescent stains. Now, strictly speaking, these two are related but distinct. First, we have antibody stains. Now, antibody stains are quite literally that certain cells or cell surfaces are marked with an antigen. The antigen will bind to a specific antibody, and the antibodies have been generated to this. You will then have, for example, a chromophore on the end of this antibody, and so when it finds its appropriate target and binds to it, and then you wash away the remainder, it will remain attached to its target. This allows you to visualize where it is. Now, a second possible way to do this is an antibody-antibody stain. The antibody-antibody approach is where you have two distinct antibodies. The first one will be to the specific structure, but you'll then have the second stain specific to that antibody. Now, the reason for doing this it can vary drastically, whereas it could be something as simple as you want to be very specific in what you're tagging, or you need two distinct processes. For example, you need to know whether or not you have two different possible antigen sites and they could be reacting with different things. So long as you have the antibody-antibody, you can rule out whether or not you're getting false positives to some extent. Now the key here is that on the end of the second antibody, you'll often find a chromophore or similar, but in some cases you may get a fluorescent stain, 
Now, fluorescent stains generally rely on one of two things, either an antibody to specifically deliver them and attach them to a certain location, or they need to be very specifically tailored to only bind to certain structures. And so when the cells undergo whatever they're doing, they will build up in only the locations that they're intended to be found at. The advantages to this is that, for example, if you're doing confocal microscopy, you're able to shine a signal down on these cells, or slides more accurately, and you're able to see, based on the light that is hitting it and the excited wavelength bouncing back at you, a fluorescence. And that fluorescence will show you one of several possibilities depending on what you've done exactly. In the case of an antibody-mediated fluorescence, you have an antibody binding to the location and, for example, which cells have that marker or antigen on them. In the case of something inside cells, you know where a certain thing is building up. So, for example, if a cell is undergoing mitoses, you can see where various structures are during different stages of mitoses, and there are a bunch of other applications. One of the more common ones would be, for example, cancer. By having a specific antigen to the cancerous cells, you can see whether or not the cancer is spreading in a particular direction, and you can more accurately inform the surgeon and tell them they need to cut more aggressively in a certain direction. As you can see, there is a wide range of stains that provide different uses and focus on different elements in histology. Some can be more or less useful, and oftentimes you will find that multiple different stains are used across different slides, and this is because you are focusing on different elements within each. It allows you to very narrowly and very specifically focus on aspects that without these aids you would not be able to see as clearly, and certainly not be able to gain useful information from, particularly in terms of diagnoses, but in other respects also for research purposes. For example, knowing the movement of certain lipids during atherosclerosis could explain some of what's going on when we talk about aneurysms the buildup of certain proteins within the brain during neurological diseases. We could also know whether or not the bacteria that you are infected with is gram-positive or gram-negative. There are a whole range of possible uses, and this is why, although these are some of the most common stains in use, this is by no means a complete and utter list of every possible stain in use, because not only are there some older stains that aren't used anymore, or at least certainly not popularly used, there are also newer options that are emerging that, that we simply don't have the opportunity to describe in great detail. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.